<laughs> so to moderate our, um, our next session, um, I'm going to hand over to Strategic Risks Editor, Helen Yates. Thank you and welcome back. Um, so our next session is called It's Not Easy Being Green. And we heard a little bit this morning about the issues surrounding greenwashing and also green hushing. Um, here to talk to us a little bit about some of the climate-related liability trends are uh, Nigel Brook and Clive Thompson. Uh, so it gets, gives me great pleasure to hand over to them. Over to you, Nigel. <coughs> so as the lawyer on the panel, I'll introduce, um, give an overview of climate litigation. And this uh, really is developing fast. It's something the insurers in particular need to pay a lot of attention to. It's been about 2,000 climate lawsuits to date uh, since the 1980s, but it's really accelerating. Over half, well over half the cases have been since the Paris Agreement at the end of 2015, and over a quarter of them have been since the beginning of 2020. And most of them are still against governments, about 70%. Ish, but that 30% is a large chunk in itself, and that's accelerating even more rapidly against companies, and now, to a limited extent, against directors. So what are the kind of trends we're seeing? A lot of these trends are pretty new. So rights-based cases. Uh, this is something that began in Europe um, just seven years ago. There's this agenda, um, an activist group, and this is another trend. We're seeing activists resort to the courts a lot more brought a case against the Dutch government saying you've got to do more. You've got to cut your emissions more rapidly than you're currently planning. They won at first instance and all the way through to the Supreme Court in the Netherlands at the end of 2019. And it was a new duty of care based on the Paris Agreement and on human rights as well. It took um, elements of the European Convention on Human Rights and embedded those into a duty of care that the Dutch government owed to its citizens. And on the back of that judgment, the Dutch government cut its emissions by another 4% in the space of a year. They, they'd been delaying and delaying, hoping they'd succeed on appeal. In the end, they just had a year, and they, they made massive cuts. And uh, we've seen that now replicated. The, there's been a rights-based case against the German government, which forced a change of policy. Um, something to watch out for, um, there's a case in the European Court of Human Rights against 33 governments, so it's the UK and all the EU governments and, and a few others besides. That goes to trial next March, and they're looking for a ruling from the European Court of Human Rights that all those governments have to move faster. It's had not a lot of publicity given its importance, uh, but watch out for that. And then what we've seen, and this is again a trend, you start a case, a kind of case against a government, and then you take it against companies. So that same theory was used against Shell, last year, and the, the Shell was ordered by the Dutch court again to cut its own emissions by 45%, not just its own emissions, but in fact the emissions from its products or the emissions of its consumers. That's under appeal. That appeal will be heard next year. But again, that's a rights-based duty of care now for the first time against a company. And there's cases like that in Germany against uh, three of the major auto manufacturers. You've heard about greenwashing already this morning, and greenwashing is in the courts now. Um, this is something they used to go to advertising agencies, uh, authorities and so on, complaints to them. They're now going to the court. And again, it's NGOs driving this. We've got high profile cases against Santos in um, Australia, against Total Energy in France, against KLM in the Netherlands. Uh, moving outside pure climate change into sustainability, this case against H&M in New York. They're proliferating now. And they are alleging either that the company is mis-selling its products, as green than they really are, or mis-selling itself and its own uh, business. The one in Australia is worth watching because that's about the contents of their annual report. And it's essentially, it's all that's being brought under consumer legislation. They're saying you misled investors about what moves you're really taking towards net zero. Uh, we're expecting a lot more of that. We know this because if you look at the websites of Green, uh, Greenpeace, not Greenwash, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, Client Earth and, and others, they have whole pages dedicated to greenwashing. And it's, it's worth a look because they, they go through the filed accounts and the public statements of major corporations across a, a lot of domains and explain why they think they're greenwashing 
in various ways. So they've, they've in a sense, marked the card of these companies. And companies are paying attention to this because, of course, the, the embarrassment factor of being sued in this way. Uh, so there's complaints about inadequate disclosure. So you've got shareholders in banks. You've got um, uh, members of pension funds saying, you're not telling me enough about the climate risk that's embedded in your business model. Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Australia is another hotspot for litigation, by the way, climate litigation. Um, Europe has now become a hotspot, surprisingly. Um, Australia is a hotspot. America, as usual, of course, is a hotspot. Whatever litigation you choose, it's a hotspot. And um, Commonwealth Bank have been picked out in particular for uh, carrying on funding new oil and gas, um, saying how, how can you square that with your climate ambitions. Directors, we haven't seen that many cases against directors to date, but that is changing. In the last month, we've had a $117 million settlement of a DNO claim. Uh, this is against the former directors of PG&E, which is a utility in California, went into bankruptcy protection about three years ago because it was beset by claims for sparking wildfires, which caused huge property losses. <clears throat> that took them into bankruptcy protection. Bondholders lost their shirts. They sued the directors saying, it's your mismanagement of this company. You could see that the incidence of wildfires was increasing, the climate was changing, uh, but you didn't up your game in terms of maintenance of equipment, cutting back vegetation and so on, it's your fault. That claim was given over to the victims of the fire after the bankruptcy settlement, and it was settled about a month ago, and that was a big hit for the DNO market. And we've got another one coming of a very different kind in the UK. Client Earth, which is an NGO law firm, is, has formally initiated the process that will lead to a claim against the current directors of Shell, saying that you're in breach of fiduciary and statutory duty in the way you're managing the company. You should be aligning the company's um, book with Net Zero and the Paris Agreement. And it's framed as a breach of duty to directors. It's not saying you must do the right thing by the planet. It's saying you must do the right thing by the company by aligning with the Paris Agreement. And that one is, is uh, one to watch. That will be fiercely defended and we will get our first ruling by the look of things on the application of um, Section 172 and 174 of Companies Act. Duties of care, existing duties of care are evolving because what's known and knowable about climate change is evolving so rapidly. You think back to five years ago, if, if you'd hosted this conference five years ago, how many people would have been here? What's known and knowable today is radically different from what it was 10 years ago, and it's going to change even more rapidly in the next five years. So if you think about a, a, a board making a decision today against what, what's known today, it goes wrong, and it's then going into court in 2027. Imagine the mindset of that court when they're looking back on that decision and what, what you took into account and what you failed to take into account. So that, that's something to watch out for. And then finally, attribution science. This is a branch of climate science that's only developed in the last 20 years, um, but it's matured rapidly. There are a few damages cases around the world. Most of them are in the USA against oil majors saying you've pumped CO2 into the atmosphere or your products have been responsible for that. Climate change is going to cause me great loss and damage in the future. You're going to compensate me for your percentage share of all global emissions to date, your, your contribution to climate change. To make that case good, assuming we can get over all the various legal hurdles, the final part will of course be to show the link between global warming generally and the specific incidence of a particular weather or uh, geophysical uh, change at the location in question. So these are cases in the States being brought by, say, San Francisco or New York. What is it that's going to happen there? Is the incidence of wildfires going to be increased? And if so, by how much? Or are they become more intense? If so, by what percentage due to their contribution to climate change? That is what attribution science is all about. And we'll probably see that test of the first time in a European case by a Peruvian farmer, Mr. Yuya, against RWE, which is Europe's largest utility. It's a case in Germany uh, that's likely to go eventually to trial, began in 2015, next year. Uh, but climate attribution science will feature um, prominently there. So that's a very quick overview. 
but it's a complex field. Thank you very much. Um, do we, can we move that next slide on? So my name is Clive Thompson. I'm the technical advisor at IRM, as well as fulfilling a role as project manager at Willis Towers Watson, um, which makes it life interesting for me, I have to say. Um, and, uh, and you'll see I've got some notes here, um, which, most of which I can um, uh, uh, rip up, I think, because most of the panelists before um, spoke uh, spoke very very um, eloquently about about stuff, um, and obviously it seems to me that um, you know what's Nigel's just related is we've got a, a big exposure out there, and an exposure that is that is uh, growing, and obviously the title of this um, session was it's not easy being green. Um, the, my bit here is. Really, it's not easy being a green risk manager, I think. That was going to be the, uh, the point about it. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, I suppose. Just before we move into um, uh, just, the, just a couple of points I wanted to raise about how we would go about managing um, some risk here, um, uh, I would like to say that um, we are all talking amongst ourselves, and we have had some consensus here. Um, and I haven't heard the word woke being used, but or nor the word Ron DeSantis coming up. <laughs> but um, but of course, uh, in terms of the investors um, asking, uh, forcing people to say something about about investment, it's very interesting to notice that um, one of your friends just told me that there's something like 17 states are enacting legislation in the states about about. Um, Making sure that your investments are um, done for supposedly for not really with sustainability at, at, in mind. So I'm not trying to be contrarian here. I'm just saying that there are that there are some um, there are some views out there which we need to take in, into account. Um, similarly, we've had resignations from um, a food company. I'm reliably informed after investments after investors alleged sustainability was being put ahead of profitability. All those things are the conflict that we have to bear in mind, I think, and those things are um, what we have to bear in mind when we look at uh, managing, um, managing risk. One of the risks here is about greenwashing. Now, green, is greenwashing a risk? Is it? You, you just told us it's a bit, a bit of a risk. Um, I think the th one of the, when I came to me preparing this talk, I thought greenwashing, well, that's a new name. It's probably a new name for something that has been around for quite a long time. Misleading is, is another name for that. Being economical with the truth was another name. Um, Sarah used the word lying. Um, I'd possibly use that, but maybe not as diplomatic, uh, diplomatic as Nigel would be, I'm sure about that. Um, having said that, it seems to me that the science is moving so damn quickly that in fact, if you don't stay up with that science, then you will be caught lying, because it's up to you to stay up with the science. And that's really that was one of the first points I wanted to make. Um, second point, you, you referred to advertising being what greenwashing is talking about advertising. I thought it was quite useful to go back to some of those advertising things. Innocent Drinks in 2022 um, had a series of nice cuddly cartoon animals going around saying um, oh drink my drink my drink drink my drink it's nice and um, it's nice and fruity um, and it's good for the planet the fact that um, Pepsi owned innocent drinks and they were making it out of non-recyclable bottles or uh, plastic bottles was held against them and the ASA I've just written here uh, the ASA held that absolute claims must be supported by a high level of substantiation and that's the whole point about greenwashing, it seems to me. We needed to see, the, the ASA said, we needed to see evidence that purchasing their products had environmental benefits and their drink bottles included non-recycled plastic, which would have had a ne negative impact on the environment. Interestingly, that was also called out by Plastics Rebellion, a pressure group. And this is an indication of all the sorts of things that are coming around, um, uh, which the risk manager has to bear in mind when you... Uh, are looking at these things. I also had the fact that Ryanair said that they were the lowest cost, lower, lowest emissions airline in 2020. Um, 
and um, I'm sure that goes very well in Irish as well. Um, the ASA said that the evidence provided was insufficient to demonstrate that Ryanair was the lowest carbon emitting airline on the basis of the metric about being CO2 per passenger. So again, it's around having that substantiation. Um, and I think if you're looking at the risk here, the risk that's being involved, what you've, what you've got is the risk of the various elements of a company thinking, this is a good idea, why don't we do this? And the board thinking, oh yeah, we'll get behind that, that's a good idea. The risk manager has to speak truth to power. The risk manager has to say, okay, where is the, this might be a good idea, but, but you can't go about claiming certain things. You have to have substantiation behind it. So that goes to the issue of governance, really. Now, of course, we've got, you know, we were talking about TCFD, and I think that, that all those elements for disclosure are going to be made, a they are a requirement for the largest companies. Where we are interested, and, and obviously IRM is interested in dealing with um, companies from the largest down to the smallest. I think from the largest companies, they have a lot of allocation, a lot of resources allocated to those these types of things. This is good, but but a lot of the smaller companies are going to need to have a look at this, and we're going to have to get the message out to these to those smaller companies. I think that they have to allocate commit, they have to allocate resources, they have to be committed to this, and they have to demonstrate and substantiate where they're going in order to manage those risks. Um, so the final piece I wanted to talk about, having told you, full disclosure, I come from Willis Towers Watson. We had Marsh McLennan in the room. We've got a lot of broking, broking talent around here. Um, i just say that um, you know, one of the things that you can do or you could do, you can do it at the moment, I'm not sure how long you'll be able to do it, is transfer your litigation risk to the insurance market. And if D&O insurers... <laughs> just don't, don't tell them. If D&O insurers are being dumped with hundreds of millions of pounds worth of claims, I suspect it's not going to be a long time before they start pulling in their horns, as they say. Um, now, at the moment, um, I'm reliably informed I haven't been in the broking market for uh, uh, 18 months or so, but I'm told that AIG has an ESG proposal form, uh, specifically for financial institutions and pension trustees. I'm not sure where that necessarily goes. Um, I'm also fairly reliably informed, and it doesn't come as a surprise, that when underwriters are asking about ESG-type issues, they're very interested in it, and they ask about the question, John, but I'm not sure what they necessarily do about the question at the moment. Um, and I'm sure you're going to come back to me about that in due time. <laughs> um, Obviously, I mean, I think one of the things is going to be that um, insurers are obviously going to have to start comparing one account to another very shortly in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions for themselves, for their supply chain, and for their customers. So their customers, are, i.e. you and me, are going to be measured about their greenhouse gas supply, greenhouse gas emission disclosures. Um, and I think that is going to be, insure, when insurers are starting to measure that, they're going to do much more than just stop insuring thermal coal, which I know we're, we're, we're doing. Um, and the risk, manager, the risk manager needs to start thinking about that now, I think, in terms of how you're going to be able to transfer some of those risks. Um, and that's really where I wanted to leave it, if that's okay because I'm sure there'll be some questions. I was going to say, we have some time, so I think we need some of the audience to ask a question. Please keep your hand up. We'll get a microphone to you. <laughs> so it's more of a response to a question than, uh, <laughs> than a question. I, it'll be a response and, and then a, a question. Yeah. So, so you asked, I think, uh, what are insurers doing about looking at the uh, or what are underwriters doing about understanding the risks associated with with a range of lines of business? And I think that's the point. Uh, these sustainability risks are a little bit like uh, cyber risks. They, they're not. They don't pertain just to one line of business. They, yeah. they may be wording in all uh, lines, which which may be relevant to a claim uh, on on topics related to um, to sustainability, N not least of all climate change as a single sustainability topic. And I think. 
just broadly, I think it's important to sort of put it in that framework about sustainability. And I didn't mention it earlier, but for anybody who wants to look at a good explanation of what sustainability risks are about and how they're managed, especially in the finance sector, but more broadly, there was a really good CRO forum paper published this time last year called Mind the Sustainability Gap. Yeah. So, so those of you who live in London will be, you know, have that in your mind, mind the gap mind the sustainability gap. So if you do an internet search, you'll find that. And it, and it talks about a lot of the stuff I mentioned earlier about double materiality. And, and actually the other really important concept is sustainability risks being risk drivers. So they're typically not in, in most companies, number risk taxonomy as uh, the major risk. So the, so the typical risks of I don't know, financial risk, market risk, credit risk, the underwriting risk, the premium reserving risk, NAT cap risk. It's not direct, you know, there's not a sustainability risk uh, in, the, in the taxonomy, but all sustainability risks influence those other risks. So they're risk drivers. So, so in your enterprise risk management framework, you've got to think about what it is that's, that's going on in, say, climate, for example, that's affecting, say, asset values that may affect your market or credit risk, for example, the transition risk that may feed into that. Or, or specifically these litigation risks, how are they going to play out? And I think actually wonderfully, Nigel and his team supported the, uh, the Bank of England when they did their biennial exploratory scenario with a range of scenarios, litigation scenarios. So I think that's another great way of going about this. So it's not just in the short term, but the long term as well, how might this play out? So, so that's my answer, uh, that, that underwriters are looking at it, but they've yeah. got to increasingly look at it. Um, my, my question for you is a, is a slightly is a related one. So, so with all the uh, broking talent in the room, uh, the Net Zero Insurance Alliance has been going for just over a year now, 18 months, and we've got a, a specific commitment within the uh, uh, NZIA to, to bring brokers as, as members. Uh, my question was, when are you guys going to uh, join up? Very good challenge. And, and I have to say, John, I was being intentionally provocative when I made my uh, comments. Um, and I know the underwriting and insurance community are doing things and will be doing things um, about that. Um, when, are, when are the broken community going to join up? I, I think I'm, I'm about to retire from the broken community. So, <laughs> so um, I'm out of the loop in that respect. Um, but uh, I hope very soon because I think there's a lot of talent in, the, in, in uh, some of the big broken houses, certainly. Uh, there's a lot of talent. And there's a lot of um, ability for them to do, for them to do some really good things, and I think the I think the willpower is there within certainly within Willis, and I suspect within Marsh, and I'm pretty confident within Aon to do the same thing. Hi, uh, hi, Alex. I'm uh, going to help John out here. So um, most insurers are heavily regulated and our friends in the regulators want us to hold capital for climate. So effectively what that means is our insurers will have to make the case for why our capacity should go to them. And uh, we, we're actually looking at three types of risk. Um, the physical risk we've been talking about all day, the transition risk, which broadly speaking means that industry may not be around. Um, that's more of a commercial risk to us. But the litigation risk, there are two really good papers, one from Geneva Association, one from U UN, and they basically give you seven sources of uh, climate litigation, which we've been running scenarios on and has started to shape our portfolio. So I think the point I'd make is it may be taken out of the underwriter's hands because at a, at a portfolio level, we may just decide we don't have appetite for certain industries uh, for E and O uh, and D and O risk, if, unless you can jump through certain hoops. So I, th I think the given that most organisations will need D and O, their boards will be pretty uncomfortable. I think it's going to drive quite a lot of behaviour change. Um, this this whole litigation environment. I absolutely agree with you, and, and I think that that's exactly what should be done yeah. as well. And I think yeah. that, that I think that's how the you know, you, you should be competing, you should be, you know, you should be choosing which account you do, you, you, yeah. you underwrite according yeah. to and the I, and I think the other sustainability thing, issues. The other thing which is interesting, because to me, and I'm a risk guy, so I would think this, but your debate about green washing versus green hushing, 
Um, so I think that's a risk appetite discussion because everybody has to make a choice. Am I going to be totally transparent, maybe too transparent? Am I going to say nothing? And, and then there'll be consequences. There'll probably be litigation at, all along that spectrum. I agree. <clears throat> Um, I just had a, a quick question for Nigel. Mm. Um, with these, um, and there are a few, I think, ESG-linked DNA products now in the market, mm. is, uh, you know, is the assumption that if you uh, prioritise certain ESG criteria, that you are a less risky organisation and less likely to be sued? <laughs> mm. Well, there, there is good research that suggests that companies with good, good ESG ratings, and of course the G is, is a really important part of this, would tend to be better run than, than ones with poorer ratings. So there is that kind of correlation. And you'd like to think that if a company is well run and climate aware, climate being one important ingredient of the E, along with a lot of other components, including biodiversity, then they should be more aware of the, the, the climate risk they face and how to mitigate it. So you, in, in big picture terms, you would think there would be that correlation. Um, I suppose a question, a challenge would be, uh, if, even if the board is, is super aware at the, at the top end, has that permeated through to all the various levels of the, the, the operating levels of the company, where mistakes could be made on a day-to-day -day basis? And does it permeate through to a knowledge of the value chain? that they sit in, because th that is also being attacked in litigation. Uh, we're seeing this, uh, for example, in France with, with case under the vigilance law where the company is being sued for malpractices deep into its supply chain in, in Latin America. So, but yes, in big picture terms, all, yeah. Thank you. Did we have any more questions? We've got time for just one more. <laughs> Sorry about this. Could you see uh, in the future a scenario where governments will be sued uh, from the regulatory and from the um, uh, requirements perspective where a company says, well, we've followed all the regulations that have been set and, and, and. Mm. And then following that logic through, could you see a scenario where whew, somebody like the IRM may be sued because they said the regulation said X, the training required for a risk manager said why. We followed all that. They were qualified. They had that qualification. So therefore, the syllabus and the competency of the risk manager that informed the CEO and etc. was fundamentally flawed and incorrect. Because there is a logic flow there. And if we're going back sort of fourth and fifth assumption steps into supply chain, there is a logic that also says we would go fourth and fifth into, well, who provided the training? And is that syllabus correct? Are we looking at the right things? Is that person qualified to do the job, etc.? And then that leads into universities, educational establishments, uh, etc. Could you see that being a real train wreck, so to speak? <laughs> I think it's fairly remote. Uh, I'd, the reason I say is this, in broad terms, regulation is, is in climate in the climate world is behind what's needed so um there's i don't not aware of any country where it, it's the the whole regulatory regime is aligned with um 1.5 degrees where where companies are required to do whatever is necessary for that country to play its part in getting there now, uk is starting down that road but it but it's baby steps at this stage so the fact that you've complied with that whatever regulations there may be would absolutely not immunize you from a lawsuit again by a broadband activist and we're seeing that at the moment there are plenty of companies who are not at all in breach of any regulations but are nonetheless exposed to realistic uh, prospect of liability in NGO um, lawsuits um, I say more generally just on just briefly on NGOs that it, it's it is worth talking to them um, because they're typically we're used to litigation where your opponent absolutely doesn't want to talk to you about what they're up to, what's their strategy, and what what what, what means are they going to use? It, you know, surprise is their is their <coughs> biggest. It's quite the opposite with the NGOs. They're using litigation typically as a means to an end, and they're very very happy to talk about the end, the objective, and why 
they're targeting certain companies. What is it about a, a company's activities, behavior, statements that, that makes them more, et cetera? Uh, we've had these kind of discussions. It's really, really useful. And um, they, they are very much hoping that if they sue a company, it will have a, an impact on that, the sector in which that company operates. We don't want to be next. That's, that's exactly the thinking they're trying to, to bring about. So. Well, I think that's a, a, probably a really good note to end on, so it's good to talk. Um, and please join me in thanking uh, Nigel and Clive for a fascinating discussion. Thank you.